It hasn't been that long since multiplayer was just another feature in single player games. And while multiplayer only games have their long list of benefits, you do sometimes lose out on the theme and story of what you're playing with. Card games by design are usually very linear in how they play out, so they benefit more from breaking the mold and offering a player a more open-ended experience than they are used to. The Warcraft IP, which is what Hearthstone is based off of, is mostly centered around player versus environment content, so single-player inclusions in Hearthstone make sense. While it will never be as popular as regular multiplayer modes, solo adventures provide a penalty-free and story-rich training experience. The first couple of adventures in Hearthstone were loosely based on World of Warcraft raids, but this trend waned as more and more liberties were being taken with the official lore. The first adventure, in addition of carts to the game since its release, was The Curse of Naxxramas, released on July of 2014. Set in the Scourge Necropolis of Naxxramas, this is a five-wing adventure with each wing representing one of the wings of the Naxxramas raid. The adventure featured a total of 30 collectible cards which could be gained through completing its five sections. The first wing was free for everyone when it was released, but now with the rest of the wings of the adventure, it must be purchased. During that time, adventures were unlike expansions. The wings were made available sequentially over the course of five weeks to keep excitement high. Upon completion of the wing, you were granted access to class challenges which rewarded specific cards and a heroic mode which was a harder difficulty mode for the same wing you just completed. The heroic mode does not provide any additional cards, but instead awards a unique card back once all 15 bosses are defeated. Kel'Thuzad, the final boss, hosts the adventure, addressing the player as they progress through. He alternates between threatening, genial, comical, and sometimes a combination of all three. During the battles, bosses and certain minions chime in at predetermined times, and sometimes in response to player actions as well. The four horsemen, Loatheb and Kel'Thuzad, each come with unique, uncollectible cards and hero powers to make your encounters more interesting, so that it's not too similar to regular multiplayer. This adventure, despite being the first, was very well received. The card rewards were also very popular. Many powerful death rattle minions and interesting new cards made a splash in the meta, and were brought into many decks. In April of 2015, eight months after the first adventure and four months after Goblin vs. Gnomes, we got Blackrock Mountain. The schedule was now alternating between expansions and adventures. From a structural point of view, Blackrock Mountain was the exact same as Naxxramas, a five-wing adventure with the same costs, class challenges, heroic mode, and release schedule of one per week. Unlike Naxxramas, however, the first wing of Blackrock Mountain was not available free of charge. Pre-ordering this adventure granted an extra card back and it featured 31 cards over the previous 30. Thematically, instead of taking an existing raid and reworking it into an adventure, Blackrock Mountain instead took a handful of raids and dungeons from a zone, Blackrock Mountain, and turned them into wings. Blackrock Depths and Spire, Molten Core, Blackwing Layer, and Descent are all group encounters in Blackrock Mountain. The adventure initially has players working with the slightly suspicious Lord Victor Nefarious to battle the Dark Iron Forces and their leader, Ragnaros. However, after defeating Ragnaros, the player decides to turn against Lord Victor Nefarious and enters the upper reaches of the mountain to slay his minions, eventually forcing Nefarious to reveal his true form, the Black Dragon Nefarian, son of Deathwing. With the aid of Ragnaros, who reveals himself not to be truly dead, the player manages to slay Nefarian. It seems though that Ragnaros is not the only one capable of faking his death, as Nefarian is not truly slain as well. Entering the dragon's hidden laboratory, the player battles through several more bosses to reach Nefarian once more, where he has a special surprise in the form of his resurrected sister, Anixia. This adventure brought cool new cards and the hold mechanic. And while many dragons and dragon synergistic cards were available in the set, Flamewalker and Grim Patron impacted the meta the most, allowing Mage to become a tier 1 deck and introducing the world to Patron Warrior. In November of 2015, the next adventure to be released was the League of Explorers. Once again bringing class challenges and a heroic mode, each wing cost 700 gold, but this time there were only 4, which made the adventure cost $20 in total. However, Blizzard really wanted to please the players during BlizzCon, so to make up for the lost wing, they added 45 new cards with this adventure. League of Explorers was not only impressive by the amount of cards it added, but it was also the first adventure that steered away from any existing World of Warcraft lore. Completely new characters and story exclusive to Hearthstone was introduced. The League of Explorers are a globe-trotting, adventure-seeking, treasure-hunting team that seeks to acquire artifacts from around the world, with the goal of preserving them in the Hall of Explorers, the greatest museum on Azeroth. The members of the League are recruiting a brave adventurer, you, to assist them in finding the Staff of Origination. You first help Reno in the Temple of Orsis to find the first piece of the staff. This is also where you encounter Temple Escape, which is the first boss encounter that completely breaks the play format. Instead of an enemy hero, this encounter is on a timer, counting down the player's attempt to escape. Each turn, events will take place, which may include ambushes, decision-making, and environmental hazards. Heading into Uldaman, you meet Bran, the League's founder who gives you the location of the headpiece. After finishing all pieces of the staff and saving Sir Finley, you meet Rafam. The Supreme 
Archaeologist! He steals the staff from you and takes over the museum. In the final wing, you defeat the animated museum exhibits and Rafam himself, and finally assemble the staff and put it in its rightful place in the museum. The cards you receive from this adventure supported and introduced a variety of decks. Never before has an adventure made this much of a meta shift. Highlander Reno decks, any Finn Paladin, and Elise Fatigue Warrior made a massive impact. Overall to date, this was probably the best adventure made. Every aspect of it was done correctly and it is remembered fondly by many. The fourth adventure arrived in August of 2016. Because it was well received, One Night in Karazhan kept the same structure as League of Explorers. This time they also gave you a prologue wing with one boss and two cards as a reward for completing it. The adventure also went in bottom-up order to simulate ascending the tower. Medivh is an important character in Warcraft story, but is generally portrayed as very grim and jaded. But here in Hearthstone, he is fun, young, and loves to host parties in his tower. In this adventure, you are at the greatest party in Azeroth, hosted by Medivh. In the prologue, you find out that a demon named Prince Malkazar has snuck into the party. Medivh tries to stomp him, but gets sucked in along with Malkazar through the portal that he tried to banish him with. Morose now needs your help to rescue Medivh from the portal at the top of the tower. Navigating to the top of the tower, you face many of Medivh's animated items. Here also you encounter the original auto chess game. Continuing up, you help Barnes prepare for a play and help the curator reel in loose monsters from the menagerie. At the end, when you reach the top, you get the control device from Nether Spite and ultimately free Medivh. The cards introduced did not really push any new archetypes. There were interesting cards like Cloaked Huntress, Malkazar's Imp, and the dreaded Barnes, but all saw play at different points in time and not immediately. While a fun adventure, it is usually remembered as the least favorite compared to the previous three. Unfortunately, One Night in Karazhan was the last iteration of adventures in that form. The Year of the Mammoth changed the release methodology to three expansions a year with no adventures. The outcry from players who missed solo content and the growing lack of different types of gameplay had adventures return, but in a different form. Beginning with the second expansion of the year, Knights of the Frozen Throne, missions were introduced. They were similar to adventures, but free entirely and provide a small amount of packs and cards as rewards. Knights of the Frozen Throne has you traverse the Ice Crown Citadel to stop the Reign of the Lich King in three wings. Completing the prologue mission rewards a random legendary Death Knight hero card and completing all eight missions will reward three packs. If the player is able to defeat the final Lich King encounter with all nine classes, Prince Arthas is unlocked as an alternate hero. In the first mission you play as Jaina and encounter the Lich King. Even with Tyrion at your side, you are overwhelmed by his power and are turned into a Death Knight. Upon becoming Frost Lich Jaina, you are turned and forced to fight Tyrion. But after defeating him, Jaina sees through her madness and becomes determined to resist the Lich King's power and become normal once more. To reach him, you have to battle through Ice Crown Citadel, meeting many of its iconic bosses. The Lich King makes wisecracks and breaks the fourth wall along the way until you finally reach the Frozen Throne to challenge him. To make the encounter more challenging, Lich King has special cards designed for each class that he plays immediately. These can be from getting 100 armor against a warrior, taking control of your minions when they die against a paladin, and not being able to emote against a priest, alluding towards the Silence Priest deck that everyone made fun of. There were many interactions and quotes that played when specific cards were cast, which was made all the more better when it was being said by one of the most iconic villains in Warcraft. While the total gameplay length of the adventure was smaller than what was used to, it was still based on a fan-favorite piece of Warcraft history, and was still better than no adventure at all. The expansion to follow, Kobolds and Catacombs, released a brand new take on the formula, Dungeon Run, an entirely new gameplay mode. Beginning with a 10 card deck, you fight bosses of increasing difficulty that add cards to your deck as you win. At certain points, you will be offered a choice between passives that affect all the cards in your deck and its playstyle. There are 8 bosses in total to face, the first 7 being from a random pool, while the final one could be something from its own shared pool of 5. Defeating bosses, leveling up your character, and looting treasure feels exactly like what a fantasy adventure dungeon crawler should be. And with all progress resetting on defeat, it was essentially a Hearthstone roguelike. Dungeon Run was a smash hit, and it supported many types of playstyles. Disguised Toast found a unique way to beat the trap room by doing nothing other than board clearing and killing the boss with fatigue. Being able to execute these interesting strategies with an emphasis on replayability caused this adventure to be extremely popular, so it made sense that the next one would share many components. On April 26th, two weeks after the release of Witchwood, Monster Hunt was added to the game. Following the success and groundwork that Dungeon Run set, Monster Hunt was another roguelike that involved deck building, passives, and eight bosses. While some of the passives were recycled from Dungeon Run, there were over 40 unique bosses to face. Shaking up the formula further was the heroes that you played. Instead of the standard 9, you now got 4 to pick from, each with their own unique hero power. The most interesting was probably Toki's Temporal Loop, which allowed you to restart your turn once, cleaning up any mistakes or failed RNG rolls. Clearing the Monster Hunt with each of the 4 heroes allowed you to battle Hygatha the Witch as the final challenge, to earn the Monster Hunt card back. 
Thematically, it was a great set. Each hunter had a unique nemesis that they encounter as their eighth boss, adding that extra bit of depth and lore to the mission. Even though Monster Hunt shared a lot of its core gameplay with Dungeon Run, it still brought plenty new to the table. The Boomsday Project was the next expansion, and two weeks into it, Puzzle Lab was added. The Hearthstone team once again completely changed what we were used to with solo adventures. Instead of the recent roguelike permadeath trend, here, puzzles were the focus. In the Puzzle Lab, puzzles would be separated into four categories. In lethal puzzles, you have to destroy the enemy hero that turn. These come up often enough during multiplayer, so it's always good to test your game sense. Board clear puzzles require you to clear the board entirely, both sides. These go beyond just defile puzzles and can also come up in multiplayer often. Survival puzzles. This situation comes up less often, but is still good for experiencing those corner cases. In these puzzles, you are required to heal to full to pass. Finally, the last category is mirror puzzles. In this one, to pass, you will need to have an identical minion lineup to your opponent. This includes everything, like location, attack, and health. While probably never relevant for multiplayer, the outside of the box thinking that these led to was why they were the most interesting. Guiding you through each puzzle section is a Booms Lab scientist, and while the puzzles can start easy, they can really ramp up in difficulty. There's no predetermined order, so you can begin with any puzzle section you want and change on a whim. Once you finish a section, you will gain access to even harder puzzles of the same type in Secret Lab guided by Dr. Boom. To date, this is considered to be the best and most unique solo player content made in Hearthstone. There was something there for every type of player, and the fast resets and smooth load times made the whole experience feel great. Again, thematically, it was right on the mark, with puzzles representing science experiments and Dr. Boom guiding us along the way. While incredibly successful and hard to top, the next set, Rastakhan's Rumble, made its debut, and nine days in, the Rumble Run game mode became available. Returning to the old Dungeon Run formula, Rumble Run is much of the same that we have seen before. You play as a young troll named Rikar, and the objective is to defeat the other eight faction champions, granting a card back upon completion. The bosses, troll legendaries of the other eight classes, are set in a specific order. Each class has three available shrines with three tiers. The deeper you are in the run, the higher tier shrine you will encounter. The shrines themselves are minions that can't leave the battlefield, but upon death go dormant for three turns. Instead of treasures this time, you will receive companions, which are powerful minions that are overstatted for their cost. Like this Herald of Flame, a 4-mana 7-7 dragon that gives dragons rush when played and draws another. There are 6 companions in total for each class. Beyond that, the rest of the gameplay is the same. Cards will be added to your deck over time, and you will choose passives that will alter the pool of cards that you have. Despite all the new ideas it brought, by this time, the Dungeon Run-esque adventure had gotten quite stale. Rumble Run was played, but not as much as other missions, and definitely not as much as its predecessor, Puzzle Labs. Changes were made in response, including additional synergies and tuning to some of the RNG, however this was too little too late. Team 5 promised that they took the feedback to heart, and everyone moved on. We now come to the present. The announcement of Rise of Shadows brought with it some new info on new solo adventure content, and this time it seems that the formula has been changed once more. From what we know at this time, it seems that we're getting a combination of the previous adventure formats. Five chapters, similar to Wings, but with a hero power progression system on top. Also advertised is 75 different unique bosses in three different modes, Normal, Heroic, and Anomaly. The rewards seem to be supersized as well, as it promises a hefty 15 card packs and one golden classic pack as its total reward pool. Having to pay for solo content in addition to having to pay for the packs of the expansion does feel like a little bit too much. While this is an impressive feature set, we will have to wait and see if it's worth the price. Solo adventures have taken many forms over the years, and I'm sure every iteration has been somebody's favorite. It will be interesting to see how this newest entry that is seemingly combining all previous adventure formats fares against the rest. Will it stretch too thin, or perhaps find a happy medium that will fulfill the wishes of everyone? We will have to wait and see. Regardless, the Warcraft lore that Hearthstone is based on is still primed for tales yet untold, and with their departure from the MMO and RTS storylines, there is more potential still. An argument could be made that adventures are wasted effort in a primarily multiplayer-focused game, but I believe they are much more popular than people think. Adventures are a refreshing break from the tense competitive atmosphere of ladder, an at-your-own-pace way to hone your game sense and dive deep into the story that can sometimes be overlooked. I'm excited for what's in store for our adventures in the future and look forward to whatever form they come in. As always, thanks for watching, and we will see you next time.